everybody, Ben Woodruff here with another falconry video. Today's video, I'm going to be talking about raptor propagation and captive breeding of birds of prey and uh, kind of some of the thoughts on that and some of the important things we need to do moving forward here. Uh, before I do that though, uh, if you haven't already, if you could please hit subscribe. I very much do appreciate all the help and support with that to keep this channel up and going. Now, falconry has been around for thousands of years and it started off as a subsistence, subsistence a uh, way of survival, uh, a way to get food. Most likely, we believe that in certain parts of the world, people would see, for example, a falcon like a sacred falcon dive down and catch something larger than it, like a bustard, like a habara bustard, that maybe it intended to eat on the ground as much as it could, even though it couldn't fly away with it. And then, oh, you see that, and you run up and you spook the falcon off, and you take its kill. And that from that idea came the idea of, well, what if we actually trapped and trained and flew one of these birds? We could do this every single day. That's kind of how we believe falconry came about, one of the ways at least, or something along those lines. And it used to be very hard to get food. People don't realize it. Uh, we live in an area, uh, a, a time that overall food is, is much more available than it was in ancient times and prehistoric times. And so because of that, we don't think nearly as much about it, what a gift it is to have any food whatsoever. And that any way to level up and get a new way to get some sort of food, some sort of extra protein was a benefit. So falconry in most parts of the world was a supplemental thing. It evolved as a way to get food uh, to supplement your normal food. So you maybe you're hunting, trying to hunt big game once in a while, maybe you have crops, maybe you're a farmer, and on the side you do falconry as well. Uh, eventually that did evolve into some of what of a status symbol where parts of the world falconry became so popular that it became sporting to, hey, we're gonna watch the athletic abilities of these wild birds doing their thing and hunting and it became really cool to watch and see. And so then different species, different breeds were used in falconry all over the world as a status symbol. So, and you still see that in some parts of the world today. But that's not the point of this. This is talking about captive breeding. It, for most of the time, for most of the history of falconry, falconry came about, again, as a way to supplement your food. Well, that's usually a fall and winter time thing. When food is scarce and you're surviving off of what crops you have, you can't go to the grocery store and buy fresh greens that are brought in from the tropics. You can't do that. And so having a bird that you could take out and hunt in the fall and winter was great. And then in the summertime, the bird would be molting. So you probably don't want to keep it. You just set it free. So people would trap a wild migrating bird, which a first year migrating bird is called a passage bird. You trap a passage bird as it's migrating, you train it, you hunt with it for the season, and then you set it free in the spring and you go back to farming. That was kind of the way things were done. Now, in the 1900s, raptor propagation was pioneered. The idea of, hey, wait, we could actually breed these birds in captivity. And that was pioneered, and it was partly done in part to help save the peregrine falcons uh, of North America. Peregrine falcons almost went extinct in the United States and, and Canada because of a pesticide, a bug spray called DDT that went up through the food chain and was making it so the peregrine eggs for multiple generations were not hatching. And so because of that, this is very key, this is very important, peregrine falcons, the ones that were in captivity that falconers had that were just flying. They were just, these are these are originally from the wild, but they're flying them and people were keeping them for years, did not have that poison in their system. And so those were used in breeding programs, pioneered, uh, you know, here in North America to be able to boost the numbers. And when those ones were released, their offspring were released in the wild, they didn't have that poison in them. Uh, that's an oversimplification. This is not a, a video about the whole process of how that came to be. And maybe I could do a more elaborate thing on how that process came into be. But the important thing is, is it's, it, captive breeding of raptors is a fairly new thing. It, uh, it, there may have been some historical things in the past where, you know, obscure groups maybe did have birds that they bred, but they didn't fly them. You know, it could have been things like that. But for the most part, it's basically understood that r captive breeding of raptors is started in the 1900s and late 1900s. So that's pretty cool. That's pretty exciting. 
to think about that it's such a very recent thing and now it has helped so many species on the brink of extinction there's all kinds of of species like tida falcons that are you know their numbers are low you have uh, you know, harp eagles, things like that, uh, Philippine eagles, where you, know, you have breeding programs to breed some of these highly endangered birds. We're like, let's make sure that we have stock in, that, that's okay, that's safe in captivity, so that if wild numbers ever tank of any of these species, we have uh, breeding stock in captivity to make sure that they're okay. Now, that's very important. That's very important. Um, now, I live in the United States. And where I live, on the one hand, we have tons of opportunities and freedoms and also some of the strictest laws regarding falconry on the planet. And I'm in Utah, which has some of the strictest in the entire country. Uh, so falconry in America, though, we can take a bird from the wild under certain extreme permits. You can get a bird from the wild. You can get a baby bird, Anias. You could trap a first year passage migrating through, okay? And you could train it for falconry. You can also, under certain ranks in the sport of falconry, purchase a captive bred bird. And they're very expensive. They're, it's very expensive to do a breeding program, so it's very expensive to get a captive bred bird. Uh, but it's not about making money, it's about having the availability for these birds. So that's kind of what I wanted to focus on about this and help people understand. I grew up, I, I was born in 1978. So I kind of came into the tail end where falconry laws really started to have a lot of teeth in them, but there was a lot of b battles for a lot of freedoms. And we've kind of ended up with where we are now, where there's kind of like, uh, you know, between the government and between the falconry community, there's understanding, there's some general procedures on how things go and some laws on how falconry works. But the idea is, hey, a falconer should have the right to be able to work their way up the ranks and to be able to fly certain birds. And they should have the right to be able to get them from the wild if the numbers and the science justifies it, or to get them captive bred, again, if they're of the right classification to be able to fly such a bird. Now, I grew up with that, and I grew up with, for a while, we had an increasing number of people who were breeding birds. Some of the people who in the 1960s and 70s had pioneered a lot of this early captive breeding uh, then bred more and more birds and shared it with their apprentices and, and, you, and that kind of took off. But what's happening now in the United States is that a lot of those people who pioneered falconry, they have stopped doing falconry. A lot of them have passed away or a lot of them have severely reduced their former propagation programs because it's so expensive to breed birds and it's so much work and you're not getting the money back out of it. It's for the love of the birds. Uh, but one of the problems we're having now is I am seeing rapidly in the past five years, the availability of captive bred raptors in the United States is tanking uh, because a lot of these people who've done it forever are getting out of it and there's not new people getting into it. And the government has made it harder and harder to get a propagation permit. And so most people are like, eh, whatever. If I want to get a captive bred bird, rather than breed my own, I'll, I'll just go buy one from somebody. But that is becoming harder and harder because fewer and fewer people are breeding these birds. It used to be easy to always find a bird available to purchase if you had the money to do so. And now we're losing that. A lot of species that uh, are, are highly specialized, like, like lanner falcons and saker falcons, uh, Eurasian kestrels, are, are some of these are almost uh, un find, you almost cannot find them anywhere it was breeders, it's really hard to find somebody to get one from in the United States now because people have been getting out of it and you haven't had a new wave of people getting back into it. So why I am bringing this up is partly, I wanna see falconry continue on and I wanna see the uh, uh, access to captive bred birds be available to falconers and wildlife educators to be able to get, but also, this is really important for the sake of wildlife conservation. Captive breeding programs are where wild, future wild stock comes from. If there is a catastrophe, if bird flu comes through and pff, wipes out some population in some country, uh, you know, like, like use the falcon examples. Let's say there's something in the Middle East that just tanks the, uh, you know, or the South African strain of lantern falcons, pff, wipes them all out uh, or almost wipes them out. Well, if we have captive bred breeding population, we can do what Project Peregrine did 
back in the day and and breed healthy stock and release them back into the wild and restock that we have the same program going on right now the same thing is happening uh with tasmanian devils there's a, a, a type of a tumorous growth, like a cancerous growth that is, that is very highly contagious that is spreading through all the wild Tasmanian devil population. And it's kind of assumed that the wild Tasmanian devils are going to go extinct. And so zoos have strategically been keeping and breeding Tasmanian devils that do not have this so that if the entire wild population is just gone of Tasmanian devils, that at some point it can be like, all right, when, when we're time is right, we're going to re-release some of these captive bred ones back in the wild to reboost the population. It's the same principle. So even if people are using these birds for falconry or for wildlife education, still captive breeding keeps that stock safe so that if there are problems that happen which do then you have this availability to to solve the problem the best you can um i have never done raptor propagation every time i have gone to do it and gotten my ducks in a row and built my muse to do it and started my paperwork something happens i get in a car accident or or i lose my job or something happens so i've never done it so um, i'm not one to talk um and sadly i wish i had because i would love to be breeding birds uh, but it takes a lot to get that up and coming, to get the birds, to get the permits, all the paperwork. It is a nightmare, and the government does not make it easy, which is, again, unfortunate because it's really important to have some of these species in captivity that are not part of the wild breeding population so that if there is a catastrophe, like, like that happened with DDT, with the peregrine falcons, there is a safe way to, to help the wild stock get back into their original numbers. So my I want to say this because I want to make people aware we in the United States are our access to captive bred birds of any kind is swiftly going out the door. The people who in the mid to late 1900s were pioneering propagation and helping with Project Peregrine and doing all these things, these people are, a lot of them are passing away, a lot of them are getting out of it because it's so much work and it's, they're not doing, never did do it for money. They did it for the love of the birds and the love of the sport. These people are rapidly getting out of it and new people are not getting into raptor propagation. And again, I'm not one to talk because I've never started my propagation program that I always wanted to do. But please, if you have any inkling or any thought to do it, now is the time in the United States because what it is a monumental effort to get any animal into the United States. So you can't just be like, well, hey, we'll just uh, get some captive breeding stock from Europe. Well, no, 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 there's this huge quarantine period. It's thousands, thousands, thousands of dollars and all this time and all these ridiculous permits and, and it's near impossible. It's practically an act of Congress to get a bird from out of the country into the United States. So just the ability, we need to make sure with what we have here that we're working to have good breeding stocks so we can have future generations, so we can have great wildlife education, so we can have access to captive bred falconry birds and that we have breeding stock to help anywhere in the world that you can have these birds be able to go back to the wild if need be uh, in these breeding programs. So I wanted to share that kind of as a, as a bit of a, a, as a call to action. If you have any desire or inkling to, as a falconer to get into uh, raptor propagation, now really is the time to do it. It's 2024 right now, and I am just sadly seeing so many of the, the raptor propagators that I grew up knowing just getting out of it or passing away or just stopping their programs. And we are swiftly going to have a time where we do not have access to these birds anymore. And uh, I think that'd be a real shame. I will always fight for both uh, captive bred birds and wild take birds. I think there's a place for both of them. I know a lot of people watching this channel, some of you live in countries where you can only do a wild take and you can't have captive bred birds. And I know some of you have the opposite where you can, uh, you, you know, it's, it's the totally opposite. So you got the full end of the spectrum here. I am lucky enough to live in a state where we have both and also where it's a state where it's insanely protected and, and regulated to try to prevent people from getting into the sport and the raptor propagation permits are no different but still now is the time while people still have decent breeding programs up and running to get uh, and, and to collaborate together and work to keep some of these species uh, still in good breeding pairs in the United States. So I wanted to sh share that just because it's something I've noticed and I've seen how hard it is these days to find breeders anymore 
and it's not something once once people are gone and out of it and they're they're they've passed on or their birds have passed on or both then it's going to be near impossible to get stock back in the united states to be able to have these amazing birds available to us so want to share that let me know your thoughts let me know what it's like in your area in your state in your country uh, what do you think it should be? What are your thoughts on on having foreign species in uh, another country? Uh, let me know your thoughts on that. Uh, I appreciate all your support on this channel. And as always, happy hawking. Mm -hmm.